Hello and welcome to the history of the USS Enterprise CVN-65. The USS Enterprise CVN-65, formerly CVAN-65, is a decommissioned United States Navy aircraft carrier. She was the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft and the eighth United States naval vessel to bear the name. Like her predecessor of World War II fame, she is nicknamed the Big E. She is the world's longest naval vessel ever built. Her 93,284 long ton displacement ranks her as the 12th heaviest carrier after the 10 carriers of the Nimitz class and the USS Gerald R. Ford. Enterprise had a crew of some 4,600 service members. The only ship of her class, Enterprise was, at the time of inactivation, the third oldest commissioned vessel in the United States Navy, after the wooden-hulled USS Constitution and USS Pueblo. She was originally scheduled for decommissioning in 2014 or 2015. Depending on the life of her reactors and the completion of her replacement, the USS Gerald R. Ford. But the National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2010 slated that the ship's retirement for 2013, when she would have served for 51 consecutive years, longer than any other U.S. aircraft carrier. Enterprise's home port was Naval Station Norfolk, Virginia, as of September 2012. Her second home port was Naval Air Station Alameda until its closure in 1997. When in port at NAS Alameda, she was visible to those crossing over the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. She was the flagship of Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz while he lived in Berkeley, California until his death in 1966. Her final deployment before inactivation began on March 10, 2012 and ended November 4, 2012. Her inactivation on December 1, 2012 underwent a 48-month inactivation process that rendered her unfit for further military service. Inactivation removes fuel, fluids, furnishings, tools, fittings, and de-energizes the ship's electrical system. Enterprise was officially decommissioned on February 3, 2012, after over 55 years of service, and with the completion of an extensive thermal overload program. She was stricken from the Naval Vessel Registry the same day. The name has been adopted by the future Gerald R. Ford class aircraft carrier, USS Enterprise CVN-80. Design Enterprise was intended as the first of a class of six carriers, but massive increases in construction costs led to the remaining vessels being canceled. Because of the huge cost of her construction, Enterprise was launched and commissioned without the planned RIM-2 Terrier missile launchers. These were never installed in the ship's self-defense suite, instead consisted of three short-range RAM-7 Sea Sparrows, basic point defense system launchers. Later upgrades added two NATO Sea Sparrow NSSM and three MK-15 Phalanx CIWS gun mounts. One mount was later removed and two 21-cell RAM-119 rolling airframe missile launchers were added. The Enterprise is also the only carrier to have more than two nuclear reactors, having an eight-reactor propulsion design, with each A2W reactors taking the place of one conventional boiler in earlier constructions. She is the only carrier with four rudders, two more than any other class, and features a more cruiser-like hull. Enterprise also had a phased array radar system known as SCANFAR. SCANFAR was intended to be better at tracking multiple airborne targets than conventional rotating antennas arrays. SCANFAR consists of two radars, the ANSPS-32 and the ANSPS-33. The ANSPS-32 was a long-range air search and target acquisition radar developed by Hughes for the U.S. Navy. 
the ANSPS-32 operated together with the ANSPS-33, which was the square array used for 3D tracking, into one system. It was installed on only two vessels, the Enterprise and the cruiser USS Long Beach, placing a massive power drain on the ship's electrical system. The technology of the ANSPS-32 was based on vacuum tubes and the system required constant repairs. The SPS-32 was a phased array radar which had a range of 400 nautical miles against large targets and 200 nautical miles against small fighter-sized targets. These early phased arrays, replaced around 1980, were responsible for the distinctive square-looking island. The AN, SPS-32, and 33 radars, while ahead of their time, suffered from issues relating to electric beam shearing mechanism and were not pursued in further ship classes. While they are considered to be an early form of phased array radar, it would take the later technology of the Agis Phased Array, ANSPY-1, with its electronically controlled beam steering to make a phased array radar both reliable and practical for the USN. Commissioning and Trials In 1958, Enterprise's keel was laid at Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. On September 24, 1960, the ship was launched and sponsored by Miss... W.B. Frankie, wife of former Secretary of the Navy. On November 25, 1961, Enterprise was commissioned with Captain Vincent P. Depog, formerly of the Fighting Squadron 6, on her predecessor in command. On January 12, 1962, the ship made her maiden voyage consisting of a three-month shakedown cruise and a lengthy series of training exercises designed to determine the full capacity of the nuclear-powered supercarrier. 1960s On February 20, 1962, Enterprise was a tracking and measuring station for the flight Friendship 7, the Project Mercury Space Capsule, in which Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn made his first American orbital space flight. In August, the carrier joined the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean Sea, returning to Norfolk, Virginia in October. 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. In October 1962, the Enterprise was dispatched to her first international crisis following revelations that the Soviet Union was constructing nuclear missile launch sites on Cuba. President John F. Kennedy ordered the United States Department of Defense to construct a large-scale build-up. Among the preparations, the U.S. Atlantic Fleet readied large numbers of its ships. On October 22, President Kennedy ordered a naval air quarantine, or blockade, on shipments of offensive military equipment to Cuba and demanded that the Soviets demantle the missile sites there. Five United States Second Fleet carriers participated in the blockade. Enterprise, Independence, Essex, Lake Champion, and Randolph, backed by shore base aircraft. By October 28, the crisis was averted after the United States secretly agreed to remove nuclear missiles from Italy and Turkey. On December 19, 1962, a Grumman E-2 Hawkeye was catapulted off the Enterprise in the first shipboard test of a nose-wheeled launch bar designed to replace the catapult Bertel. Minutes later, a second launch with the launch bar was made by a Grumman A-6A intruder demonstrating one of the primary design goals of reducing launch intervals. In 1963 to 1964, now under the command of Captain Frederick Michaels, Enterprise made her second and third deployments to the Mediterranean. During her third deployment, the carrier was part of Operation Sea Orbit, the world's first nuclear-powered task force with carriers Long Beach and Brandbridge, together forming a small convoy to set sail around the world. In October 1964, Enterprise returned to Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company for her first refueling and overhaul. Vietnam Deployment 
In November 1965, the Big E was transferred to the 7th Fleet, home ported in NAS Alameda, California. The following month, December 2nd, she became the first nuclear-powered ship to engage in combat when she landed aircraft against the Viet Cong near Bia Ho City. The ship led Carrier Division 3. The Enterprise, redesignated CVAN-65, which had Carrier Air Wing 9 aboard, Branbridge, Barry, and Samuel B. Roberts, Enterprise launched 125 sorties on the first day unleashing 167 short tons of bombs and rockets on the enemy supply lines. On December 3rd, she set a record of 165 strike sorties in a single day. When the Enterprise departed the Gulf of Tonkin on June 20th, 1967, her pilots had flown more than 13,400 battle missions during 132 days of combat. As Vice Admiral Highland stated in his congratulatory statement, the entire Air Wing 9 has earned a resounding well done. The carrier had steamed 67,630 miles in operation with the 7th Fleet. She arrived in Subic Bay on June 22nd and departed on June 25th for a return to Alameda on July 6, 1967. At Alameda, the Enterprise began an overhaul. Captain Kent Lee relieved Captain James L. Halloway as commanding officer in ceremonies on July 11, 1967. Shipyard work was completed on September 5, 1967, and after completing sea trials on September 7, the Enterprise steamed south for San Francisco Bay to San Diego to re-embark carrier wing 9 and get underway for a refresher training off the California coast. Enterprise was visiting Sasebo, Japan in January 1968 when the U.S. intelligence ships USS Pueblo was seized by North Korea and she served as flagship of TF-91 Rear Admiral Epps which had been formed in response. When diplomatic negotiations had defueled tensions, Enterprise and her escorts were released to head south to Yankee Station on February 16, 1968. The Enterprise returned to the NAS Alameda on July 18, 1968, having completed 12,839 catapult launches with 12,246 sorties, 9,182 of them in combat. After a short overhaul in Puget Sound Naval Shipyard from July 29th to September 26th, she returned to Alameda to prepare for another deployment to Vietnam. The 1969 Fire During the morning of January 14th, 1969, while being escorted by the destroyers Benjamin Sauter and Rogers, a MK-32 Zuni rocket loaded on a parked F-4 Phantom exploded when the audience cooked off after being overheated by an aircraft unit. The explosion set off fires and additional explosions across the flight deck. The fires were brought under control relatively quickly. When compared with previous carrier flight deck fires, but 27 sailors were killed and an additional 314 sailors were injured. The fire destroyed 15 aircraft and the resulting damage forced the Enterprise to put in for repairs at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, primarily to repair the flight deck's armored plating. On March 1, 1969, repairs to the ship were complete and the ship proceeded on her scheduled Western Pacific deployment to Vietnam and the Token Gulf. These destinations would be delayed by events in the Eastern Sea of Japan. Korean Operations In January 1968, the capture of the United States intelligence gathering vessel Pueblo led to a diplomatic crisis. The Enterprise was ordered to operate near the South Korea waters for almost a month. On April 14, 1969, tensions with North Korea flared again as a North Korean aircraft shot down a Lockheed EC-121 
Warning Star that was on a reconnaissance flight patrol over the eastern sea of Japan from its base at Sugi, Japan. The entire 31-man crew was killed. The U.S. responded by activating Task Force 71 to protect future such flights over those international waters. Initially, the task force was to comprise Enterprise, Ticonderoga, Ranger, and Hornet with a screen of cruisers and destroyers. Enterprise arrived on station with the TF-71. Enterprise arrived with Task Force 71 in late April after the completion of repairs. The ships of Task Force 71 came mostly from Southeast Asia duty. This deployment became one of the largest shows of force in the area since the Korean War. In all, the Enterprise made six combat deployments to Southeast Asia from 1965 to 1975. 1970s. In 1969 to 1970, Enterprise returned to Newport News shipbuilding and went through an overhaul and her second refitting. In January 1971, she completed sea trials with the newly designed nuclear reactor cores that contained enough energy for 10 years. Enterprise, with Captain Forrest S. Peterson now in command, then departed for Vietnam again to provide air support for American and South Vietnamese units. In Vietnam, Enterprise, Orkansky, and Midway launched a total of 2001 strike sorties by July 30, 1971. Strike operations in July were disrupted when the carriers on the station evaded three typhoons, Harriet, Kim, and Jean. A slight increase in South Vietnam strike sorties occurred during that month. These were mainly visual strikes against enemy troop positions in support of U.S. helicopter operations. From August to November 71, Enterprise was in operations on Yankee Station. In December 71, Captain Ernst E. Tessett Jr. assumed command and the Enterprise was deployed to the Bay of Bengal during the Bangladesh Liberation War as a show of strength against India's naval blockade by the INS Vikrant. Later, a Soviet Navy submarine was also trailing the U.S. task force. A confrontation was averted when the Americans moved towards the Southeast Asia away from the Indian Ocean. On December 18, 72, the United States resumed bombing campaigns above the 20th parallel under the name Linebacker 2. During the Linebacker 2 operations, Enterprise and other carriers on the station reseeded the minefields in the Halipong Harbor and conducted concentrated strikes against surface-to-air missile and anti-aircraft artillery sites. Enemy army barracks, petroleum storage areas, Halipong naval and shipyard areas, and railroad and truck stations. Navy tactical air sorties under Linebacker 2 were centered in coastal areas around Hanong and Halipong there were 705 Navy sorties in this area during Linebacker 2 between December 18th and the 22nd. The Navy conducted 119 Linebacker 2 strikes in North Vietnam, with the main limiting factor on airstrikes being bad weather. In December 1972, the North Vietnamese returned to the peace table and Linebacker 2 ended. In January 1973, the Vietnamese ceasefire was announced and American carriers ceased all combat sorties into North and South Vietnam. From January 28, 1973, aircraft from the Enterprise and Ranger flew 81 combat sorties against lines of communication targets in Laos, the corridor for overflights between Hue and Da Nang in South Vietnam. These combat support sorties were flown in support of Laotian government, which had requested this assistance. Laos had no relationship with the ceasefire in Vietnam. Post-Vietnam After the ceasefire in Vietnam in 1973, Enterprise proceeded to Puget Sound Naval Shipyards, Birmingham, Washington, where the carrier was altered and refitted to support the Navy's newest fighter aircraft the Grumman and F-14 Tomcat. Two of four jet blast deflectors were enlarged to accommodate the Tomcat. 
The number four propulsion shaft was replaced. It had been bent when its screw had been fouled in a discarded arrest gear cable. On March 18, 1974, the first operations of Tomcat's VF-1 Wolfpack and VF-2 Bounty Hunters made their maiden takeoff and landings from the carrier. In September 1974, Enterprise became the first carrier to deploy the new fighter plane when she made her seventh Westpac deployment. In February 1975, Typhoon Gervali struck the island nation of the Martuis and the Enterprise was ordered to provide disaster relief. Arriving at Port Louis, carrier personnel spent more than 10,000 man-hours rendering such assistance as restoring water, power, and telephone systems, clearing roads and debris, and providing helicopter medical food and drinkable water support to the stricken areas. Operation Frequent Wind in April 1975, Enterprise Midway, Coral Sea, Hancock, and Okinawa were deployed in the waters off Vietnam for possible evacuation contingencies as North Vietnam, in violation of the Paris Peace Accords, launched a conventional invasion of South Vietnam. On April 29th, Operation Frequent Wind was carried out by U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps helicopters from the 7th Fleet. The operation involved the evacuation of American citizens and at-risk Vietnamese from Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, under heavy attack from the invading forces of North Vietnam. President Gerald Ford ordered the helicopter evacuation when PAVN shelling forces in the cessation of the fixed-wing evacuation from Tan Son Nuc Airport. With fighter cover provided by carrier aircraft, the helicopters landed at the U.S. Embassy, Saigon, and the DAO compound to pick up evacuees. The last helicopter lifted off the roof of the United States Embassy at 7.53 a.m. local time. On April 30, 1975, carrying the last 11 Marine security guards. During Operation Frequent Wind, aircraft from the Enterprise flew 95 sorties. In July 1976, Enterprise began her 8th Western Pacific deployment. Beginning in October, she took part in the Anzus exercise, Kangaroo 2, with the ships of Australian and New Zealand natives. One of the ports visited was Hobart, Tanzania, in November 1976. It had also been the first time an American ship anchored in the nation's capital harbor, Hobart since the early 1920s. A beer with the picture of the Enterprise for its label was just one of the commemorations received by the renowned nuclear carrier. In February 1977, Ida Amin, the president of Uganda, made declaratory remarks against the United States in public and Americans in Uganda were taken hostage. This was several months after the Israel raid at Intibi Airport. Enterprise and her escort ships were scheduled to transit home after a seventh-month deployment, but having just left Mombasa after a port call, were directed to remain in the area and operations off the East African coast for about a week. The ship's marine detachment and air wing provided for possible mission to rescue and evacuate the Americans, but Amen eventually released all the hostages. The ships then steamed across the Indian Ocean at high speed to make a previous scheduled final port call, Kubi Point, in the Philippines before returning to Nass Alameda. In 1978, Enterprise underwent her ninth Western Pacific deployment, including port calls in Hong Kong, Perth, Australia, and Singapore. In January 1979, the carrier sailed into Puget Sound Naval Shipyards for a comprehensive 36-month overhaul. This overhaul modified the ship's superstructure, removing the scan-far radars and the unique inverted cone-shaped top section, which was three stories high. During this lengthy overhaul, Navy and shipyard personnel referred to the Enterprise as Building 65. 1980s! In 1982, the carrier made her 10th Westpac deployment. 
In April 1983, Enterprise ran aground on a sandbar in San Francisco Bay while returning from deployment and remained stuck there for several hours. Coincidentally, George Takei, who played Mr. Sulu, helmsman of the fictional starship Enterprise, was aboard at that time as a guest of the Navy. Even though grounding and collisions are usually career enders for U.S. wartime captains, the captain at that time, Robert J. Kelly, who had already been selected for promotion to Commodore, eventually became a four-star admiral and commander-in-chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. In 1984, the Enterprise began training for her 11th Westpac deployment. Late at night on November 2nd, 1985, with Captain Robert L. Luncher Jr. on the bridge, she struck Bishop Rock on the Cortez Bank during the fight exercises, damaging the outer hull with a gash more than 100 feet in length and knocking out of one propeller. The cost of repairing the damage was $17 million and Lucianer was relieved of command on January 27, 1986 as a result of the incident. In 1986, the carrier made her 12th Westpac deployment, leaving January 15, 1986. She led the battle group Foxtrot, including Trustin, Arkansas, O'Brien, Reasoner, Lewis P. Puller, Mikowski, David R. Ray, and Wabash. The battle group sailed directly for the Indian Ocean with stops in Hawaii, Subic Bay, and Singapore. On April 28, 1986, Enterprise became the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier to transit the Suez Canal. She went from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean to relieve Coral Sea on station with America off the coast of Libya. Enterprise entered the Mediterranean to support Operation El Dorado Canyon, the U.S. bombing of Libya. It was the ship's first visit to the Mediterranean in more than 22 years. During the deployment, Rear Admiral T.J. Howe was relieved as Commander Cruiser Destroyer Group 3 by Rear Admiral Paul David Miller. In February 1988, Enterprise underwent her 13th deployment and was assigned to Operation Ernst Will, escorting reflagged Kuwaiti oil tankers to the Persian Gulf. On April 14th, Another Ernst Will ship, Samuel B. Roberts, struck an Iranian mine in international waters. In response, the U.S. launched Operation Praying Mantis against the Iranian targets, starting with two Iranian oil platforms that were being used as support bases for Iranian attacks on merchant shipping. Aircraft from the Enterprise's CWV-11 bombed two Iranian frigates, helping to sink one and damaging the other, and providing other air support for the strike. In September 1989, Enterprise left Alameda and began her 14th overseas deployment and around-the-world cruise that would end at the ship's new home port of Naval Station Norfolk. In early December 1989, Enterprise and Midway participated in Operation Classic Resolve, President George W. Bush's response to the Philippine President Coranzin Agudo's request for air support during the rebel coup attempt. Enterprise remained on station conducting flight operations in the waters outside Melita Bay until the situation subsided. 1990s! In April 1990, Enterprise completed her around-the-world deployment, arriving in Norfolk, Virginia, after having steamed more than 43,000 miles. In October, the carrier moved to Newport News Shipbuilding for refueling and the Navy's largest complex overhaul refit ever attempted. On September 27, 1994, Enterprise returned to the sea for sea trials. Now, with Captain Richard J. Nocton in command, during which she performed an extensive full-power run as fast as when she was new. On June 28, 1996, Enterprise began her 15th overseas deployment. The carrier enforced no-fly zones in Bosnia as part of Operation Joint Endeavor and over Iraq as part of Operation Southern Watch. The deployment ended in December 1996, which also made the end of active service for the Grumman A-6 intruder. 
from the Navy. In February 1997, Enterprise entered Newport News Shipbuilding for an extended selective restricted ability lasting four and a half months. In November 1988, following workups, Enterprise departed on her 16th overseas deployment with CV-3 embarked. On the 9th of November 8th, shortly after the start of deployment, a Northrop Grumman EA-6B Prowler crashed into a Lockheed S-3 Viking on the carrier's deck. The mishap occurred as the EA-6B was landing during a night carrier qualifications striking the folded wings of the S-3, which had not yet cleared the landing area of the flight deck. The four crew of the EA-6B perished when the aircraft hit the water, but the two crew members on the S-3 ejected. A fire broke out on the flight deck, but was quickly extinguished by the flight deck crew. Three of the four members of the Prowler were lost at sea and the remains of the fourth were recovered shortly after the crash. The crew of the Viking were rushed to the Naval Medical Center in Portsmouth, Virginia. There were no other significant injuries. An extensive search for the missing EA-6B Prowler crew members was suspended after nearly 24 hours. On November 23, 1998, Enterprise relieved the Dwight D. Eisenhower in the Persian Gulf. During a port call in Jabal Ali, UAE, the carrier hosted former President George H.W. Bush and enjoyed a live concert by Grammy award-winning rock group Hootie and the Blowfish. In December 1998, Enterprise Battle Group spearheaded Operation Desert Fox, destroying Iraqi military targets with more than 300 Tomahawk land attack missiles and 691,000 pounds of ordnance. The 70-hour assault was carried out by Enterprise, Gettysburg, Stout, Nicolum, and Miami. Shortly after the Rack massacre and failure of the Yugoslavian peace talks in Rambolet, France, Enterprise quickly left a port visit in Carnes, France to return to the Adriatic. In early March 1999, Enterprise returned to the Persian Gulf to relieve Carl Vinson in support of Operation Southern Watch, returning to North Fork in May 1999. During the 1998-1999 deployment, Enterprise steamed more than 50,000 miles and spent 151 days underway. Enterprise Battle Group was first deployed with the IT-21, which allowed unprecedented internal and external communication capabilities, including internet, email, and television. The 2000s. On April 25, 2001, Enterprise began her 17th overseas deployment with CVW-8, embarked with Captain James A. Winfield, Jr. in command. From June 18 through the 28th, the carrier and four escorts participated in exercises with the Royal Navy in a joint combined warfare training exercise in the North Sea, near the Hebrides, and in Scotland. Enterprise was beginning her voyage home from the Persian Gulf when the September 11th attacks were carried out. Without orders, the Enterprise returned to the waters off Southwest Asia near the Persian Gulf, outrunning her escorts. In October 2001, the United States launched air attacks against Al-Qaeda training camps and Taliban military installations in Afghanistan. The actions were designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a base for terrorist operations and to attack military capability of the Taliban regime. Over three weeks, aircraft from the Enterprise flew nearly 700 missions and dropped over 800,000 pounds of ordnance against Afghanistan. On November 10th, the carrier arrived at her home port in Norfolk, Virginia, 16 days later than originally planned. During her last day at sea, the ship hosted a live two-hour broadcast of ABC's Good Morning America. Garth Brooks performed a concert with Jewel from Enterprise on November 21st while she was docked at North Fork, Virginia. The concert was carried live on CBS on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7, 2001. 
President George W. Bush addressed the sailors of the Enterprise from his flight deck. In January 2002, Enterprise entered the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, Portsmouth, Virginia, for a scheduled one-year extended dry dock selected restricted availability. Iraq War Operations Iraqi Freedom From September 2003 to February 2004, the ship deployed to relieve four carriers that were on station during the invasion of Iraq. Enterprise's role was to provide continued air support for the Operation Iraqi Freedom. The fully repaired Cole was a member of her escort group at the time. A USO tour was held while aboard at sea with wrestler Kurt Angle, NASCAR racer Mike Wallace, and comedian Robin Williams giving talks and performances. The ship made several port calls to Jebel Ali, a stop in Bahrain and Naples, Italy, and Spain on the way home. Admiral James Starvridix commanded the battle group at this time with Captain Eric Nedelinkter as Enterprise's commanding officer. In April 2004, Enterprise participated in Fleet Week celebrations in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Enterprise's damage control team won the damage control Olympics at the event, setting several records in the process. In June and July 2004, the ship participated in Summer Surge 2004 and several multinational exercises. She participated in photo ops of multinational battle group and was anchored at Portsmouth, England on the 4th of July. 2005 saw the ship in for another routine shipyard overhaul at Newport News Shipyard in Newport News, Virginia. Departing the dock after this shipyard period, Enterprise ran through a sandbar, causing all eight reactors to shut down, leaving the ship to drift on emergency power for more than three hours before she was tugged back to her pier at North Fork Naval Base. It took approximately three days for the ship's nuclear mechanics to clear her condensers of river mud. In May 2006, Enterprise departed for a six-month deployment operating in the 6th, 5th, and 7th Fleet areas in a world tour supporting Operation Iraq and Enduring Freedom and visiting ports in Dubai, Hong Kong, and crossing the line. Crossing the line ceremony is performed when a person crosses the equator for the first time. She returned to Norfolk on November 18, 2006. On December 19, 2007, the carrier returned home after a six-month deployment in the Persian Gulf. In April 2008, Enterprise entered the Northrop Grumman Newport News Shipyards for a scheduled 18-month extended docking selection restricted ability. With a projected completion date of September 2009. As maintenance was performed, costs continued to rise above projections and the completion date repeatedly slid. Enterprise, the oldest active combat vessel in the Navy, was scheduled to be decommissioned as of late of 2014. On April 6, 2009, Admiral Gary Roughhead, Chief of Naval Operations, stated that he was seeking congression dispensation to speed up the process to decommission the Enterprise. Under this new timetable, the ship would complete one final deployment before being decommissioned in late 2012 or early 2013. This would temporarily reduce the U.S. Navy's to having only 10 active aircraft carriers through the launch of the Gerald R. Ford in 2015. In October 2009, the House and Senate Armed Services Committees agreed with the recommendation approving the decommissioning of the Enterprise in 2013 after 51 years of service. 2010s. In April 2010, the Navy announced that the cost of refurbishing the carrier has risen to $655 million and was scheduled to be completed in the same month. On April 19, 2010, Enterprise left Northrop Grumman shipyards to conduct sea trials in preparation for return to the fleet. The cost of refurbishment of the carrier was $662 million, which was 46% over budget. Also, it took eight months longer than scheduled. 
The Navy said it planned to use the carrier for two six-month deployments before her scheduled 2013 decommission date. The carrier and her strike group deployed January 13, 2011, accompanying the carrier on the cruise to the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean, were Carrier Air Wing 1, Guided Missile Cruiser Lyette Gulf, and Guided Missile Cruiser Barry, Bulky, and Madison in February 2011. Enterprise was involved with an incident with Somali pirates, an event that ended in the death of four American civilians and two pirates. The carrier returned to Norfolk on July 15, 2011. During its deployment, it had participated in operations that captured 75 Somali pirates, and its strike group made missile strikes against the Libyan government. On April 9, 2012, the Navy announced that the Enterprise and her group, Carrier Strike Group 12, would be assigned to join the Abraham Lincoln in the Persian Gulf. The mission was described as routine, not a response to a specific threat, upon completion of this cruise in fall 2012. Enterprise was scheduled to be deactivated. In October 2012, Enterprise transited the Suez Canal for the final time. She paid her last foreign port call when she visited Naples, Italy between October 16th and 21st, which had been the Big E's first foreign port of call 50 years earlier. On November 4th, 2012, Enterprise returned to her home port at the Naval Station Norfolk, Virginia for the last time. While on her last journey, the carrier cruised nearly 81,000 miles in a 238-day deployment to the Persian Gulf, and her aircraft flew more than 2,000 sorties in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. Decommissioning The Enterprise was deactivated on December 1, 2012 at the North Fork Naval Station, Virginia. The deactivation of the Enterprise resulted in a one-time increase of approximately 857.3 million in depot maintenance costs for the Navy's operation and maintenance budget for the fiscal year. Enterprise was the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier to be decommissioned. Naval enthusiasts have requested that the Enterprise be converted into a museum. While the costs of doing so, regardless of their nuclear reactors, have yet to be calculated by the United States Department of Defense. By 2012, they had been deemed too expensive to make such an effort practical. In addition to the fact that the ship will need to be partially dismantled anyway to remove the eight reactors safely. A petition has also been set up for the next carrier, CVN-80, to be named as the ninth USS Enterprise. At her inactivation ceremony, Secretary of the Navy Ray Mabus announced in his taped message that the next Ford-class carrier, CVN-80, would be named the Enterprise. Speaking at the ceremony was Chaplain John Owens, Captain William C. Hamilton, Jr., Vice Admiral David H. Buss, Admiral John Richardson, Matt Muharin, Admiral John W. Greenert, and a video speech from Ray Marbus, and the Master of Ceremonies was the ship's executive officer. VIPs present for the ceremony included several former commanding officers, a granddaughter of the ship's sponsor, and a former A-6 pilot, Eugene McDaniels, who had been captured in North Vietnam, who had returned to the ship for the first time since the day he was shot down receiving a standing ovation as introduction. During the ceremony, the representatives of the ship's sponsor received a flag flown from the ship during its last underway and a piece of wooden railing leading to the CO's import cabin. Also, the CNO was present with a time capsule produced by the ship's crew with artifacts and pieces of the ship. Enterprise crew and visitors were encouraged to add items or messages of the week before inactivation. While presenting the capsule, Commanding Officer William C. Boomer Hamilton informed the CO that the only stipulation would be that the capsule could only be opened by the crew of the next ship to be named Enterprise. When it was announced shortly after that, the CVN-80 would be the ninth Navy vessel to carry the name Enterprise. The entire crowd cheered 
and gave a standing ovation. On February 8, 2013, the United States Department of Defense announced that a number of nuclear projects would have to be postponed until the upcoming budget sequester issue was resolved. These included the planning defueling of the Enterprise as well as the midlife overhauls for two Nimitz-class ships. Once the Navy completes the fuel removal, the ship will be placed in long-term storage pending reviews of technical and environmental procedures on how to properly dispose of the carrier. In October 2014, Newport News Shipbuilding announced that one of the Enterprise anchors removed from the ship during deactivation had been transferred to the Nimitz-class Abraham Lincoln during her RCHO. On October 15, 2015, Captain Todd Blurtz received Captain William C. Hamilton, Jr. as the Enterprise's commanding officer. Captain Blurtz was the ship's last commanding officer. The final reactor was defueled on December 2016 with decommissioning on February 3, 2017. The same day, the ship was stricken from the Naval Vessel Registry. According to Navy Sea Systems Command, the recycling of the Enterprise has been delayed by the Navy until further information on more technically executable environmental response. The decommissioned carrier will be put in storage after its inactivation is complete in August. In early 2017, it was announced that steel from the CVN-65 will be recycled and used to construct the CVN-80. In May 2017, Newport News Shipbuilding moved the Enterprise to a different area of the yard in order to continue its work on inactivation and eventual towing out of Hampton Roads. Tugboats guided the carrier from dry dock 10 to Pier 2. The shipyard had completed all dry dock related work and moving it to the pier will allow the shipyard to complete the remaining tasks involved in inactivation. That includes closing compartments and preparing work related to dismantling and towing. On April 10, 2018, Newport News Shipbuilding announced that the Enterprise's inactivation process has been completed. Enterprise will be stored at Hampton Roads until disposal plans can be determined by the Navy. Thank you for watching the history of the USS Enterprise CVN-65. This episode is dedicated in loving memory of Kim Vermillion Ormiston.